So in this video, we're going to look at some of the nuances of the friction force, which is a particularly interesting force um, in some different situations. So first, we're going to look at the situation of a regular car just driving along. Um, it's driving without skidding. So that means the wheels are just rolling normally. They're not slipping out and not skidding out. Um, how is the car even accelerating forwards, right? If there's an acceleration, there must be a force forwards. Um, I know that a car feels gravity, right? FG. I know that a car feels the normal force, but what is the force pulling that car forward here? Well, it's not the force of the engine. Um, that's because the engine is an internal force, but the engine is only pushing on the axle, which is inside the car. Um, and it's not the force of that axle pushing on the wheel, that's also internal. Um, the wheel is then pushing on the road, but that's a force from my object on the surroundings, so that couldn't be the force pulling the car forward. It has to be a, a force from the surroundings on my object, on the car, to be drawn on my free body diagram and to actually cause acceleration. The only external thing that could be pulling on the car is actually the road. And that is actually what's pulling your car forward. It's actually the road. This force right here is a force of friction from the road. So it's actually friction that makes your car accelerate. If you put your car on really, really slippery ice and you press the gas, you're not going to go anywhere. You have to have friction in order to accelerate. That's the force that's directly making you move forwards. That feels a bit weird though. First off, because friction in our minds opposes motion, right? That's kind of how we think about friction. That's actually not quite true. Technically, friction opposes relative motion between surfaces. So friction does not oppose motion. Friction, if the car's moving forward, friction doesn't say, oh, I'm gonna be backwards. Friction can also be forward or backwards. It's opposing the relative motion between surfaces. So this is where we have to kind of zoom in. So I have the crayons is gonna be, this is the road here. This electrical tape is my wheel. So we're zooming in on basically the interface between the wheel and the road. So notice as the wheel turns, the wheel is spinning so that the part against the road is actually pushing backwards here, right? So I'll show you the wheel turning. See how the part at the bottom is rotating backwards? Do it again. You can see how that's kind of rotating in the backwards direction. That means the wheel is pushing backwards on the road. If the road was able to move and the wheel started rotating like this, the road would start going like this, right? It would be pushed in that direction. Of course, the road doesn't move. Um, so instead, the road stays still and forces the car, that wheel, to move forwards. So the wheel pushes back on the road. The road says, hey, I'm not taking any of that. Pushes back on the wheel. That law is Newton's third law. So if the wheel is pushing backwards on the road, the road is going to push forwards on the wheel. That's Newton's third law here. And the action forces that wheel pushing back on the road. I'll just draw a zoomed in picture for you here. So here's the wheel. Here's the road. The wheel's rotating like this. So the wheel pushes backwards on the road. The road says, I don't want any of that, and pushes forwards on the wheel. And that is the friction force. So the road pushes forwards on the wheel, which is friction. And that is why your wheel actually moves forwards. All right, what kind of friction is this? Right? We care about if it's static or kinetic friction. If you remember, static friction is friction where the two surfaces aren't sliding past each other. The objects can be moving, but the surfaces can't be sliding. Um, and kinetic friction is where there is sliding going on. So let's look closely at this situation again. So the wheel is rolling. The wheel is definitely moving, but notice how at no point are the surfaces sliding past each other. In fact, the surfaces are static relative to each other. So this is a static friction if you have rolling without skidding. If this wheel was skidding, so just doing this, just sliding along, that would be kinetic friction. But because it's rolling without skidding out, that must be a static friction. So I can add to my picture up here, I said a friction force was pushing us forward, it's a static friction force. I can call it F, F, S there. Okay, so the object is moving. That doesn't necessarily mean it's kinetic friction. Kinetic friction just means sliding. The car isn't sliding, so therefore it must be static friction. Let's do a situation where the car is sliding. So 
let's say you're driving on an icy road, you uh, put your brakes on and the brakes lock, maybe you don't have ABS brakes, so the brakes just lock. So now the wheel is still, it's not rolling at all, it's locked. Um, and the car, of course, is on an icy road, it's gonna keep on moving forward even though the wheel has stopped. So the car's just gonna slide across the ice like this. What kind of friction would that be? Well, of course, that is going to be a kinetic friction because the car is sliding. Now let's zoom in on what's happening at those wheels, right? In this case, the wheels are not rotating, they're just sliding. So here, the wheel is trying to push forwards on the road, completely the opposite of before, right? And so the kinetic friction is gonna oppose that slide, it's gonna be backwards. So here, the FFK must be backwards. So it's opposing the relative motion between surface, surfaces, the relative motion between the, the tire and the road. And in this case, for a locked wheel, just skidding along ice, that's gonna be backwards. Okay, here's another situation. Let's say you are in the mud and you're trying to accelerate forward. So you press the accelerator really hard, um, but your wheels are just totally covered in mud. They just spin, your car goes nowhere. So in this situation, let's zoom in on what's happening here. So here the, the tire is spinning, but it's not going anywhere. So if the tire is spinning as if it was supposed to be going forward, so it's spinning in this direction, you can see at the bottom here, the wheel is pushing backwards on the road, which means friction is going to oppose that and push forwards on the wheel. So here, we're going to get a forwards friction force. So it's a forwards friction force. And the kind of friction, once again, the wheel is spinning, but it's not, um, it's not rolling nicely like this. So it's just slipping past the road, right? Like, cause there's mud under there. So it just, it's skidding out, sort of, it's spinning around, but not actually uh, making any gains. So you can see that there's a slipping um, past surfaces here. So that's a kinetic friction. So this is also kinetic friction. But in this case, it's forward. So FFK is what I'll put on my picture. All right, so that's some of the nuances with cars. Um, let's look a little bit closer at calculating the friction force. So the friction force depends on two different things. First, the friction force depends on the normal force on the object that's feeling the friction and the coefficient of friction between the two materials. We'll talk about what that is in a second. So first, why does friction depend on the normal force? Um, well, let's say you've got an object uh, sitting on a surface. I've kind of zoomed in intentionally on the interface between the object and the surface. So let's say this is just my eraser sitting on the crayon box. If we zoom in enough, we'll see that both of these surfaces are rough, right? Especially when you go down to the level of molecules, you'll see they're both rough. Um, and if we have a small normal force, that means there's going to be a little bit of space between the eraser and the crayon box, a little bit more space. I mean, not enough space that you could actually see it like this here. Um, I'm sort of exaggerating. Uh, if we have a larger normal force, then that space gets a bit smaller. There's always a little bit of space because molecules are gonna repel each other, they can't go through each other, um, but that space gets smaller. And you can imagine if the space gets smaller, there's gonna be more um, interactions and more attractive forces between the eraser and the crayons. It's gonna make it harder to slide the eraser past the crayons. So that's roughly why the normal force depends, uh, why the friction force depends on the normal force. The coefficient of friction is a measure of how rough the materials are. So it kind of makes sense that if the materials are a little bit more rough, it's going to be harder to slide them against each other than if they're really smooth. So the coefficient of friction tells you about the smoothness or roughness of materials. So since friction depends on the normal force and the coefficient of friction, it's not too surprising that you'll see both of those in the equations for kinetic and static friction. So first, kinetic friction, so FFK is just equal to mu K, that's the coefficient of kinetic friction times the normal force. So there's actually different coefficients of friction um, or different measures of roughness for whether the object is sliding past, so the two surfaces are sliding past each other, or if they're static relative to each other. Mu K is the one we use if they are sliding past. Um, 
Actually, interestingly, mu k is often, for most surfaces, a little bit less than mu s, which is the static coefficient of friction. And you can kind of feel that if you are maybe trying to slide your hand across your desk. So if I just slide my hand across my desk and I'm just letting it slide, this is kinetic friction that I'm feeling. I can feel there's like a little bit of resistance to me sliding here. But if I stop, if I'm initially stopped and then I have to break that, it's, I can tell that it's harder to break it. And once I get going, then it's easier. So there's like this initial static friction that's hard to overcome. Once I get sliding, it's easier. The same is true with like any materials. I can do this with my eraser. I have to press pretty hard to get it going. And then once it's moving, it's easier to keep it going. And um, that's because the kinetic friction is a little bit less um, than the static friction for most materials. Um, and that's just because if you're slide, if two objects are sliding past each other, um, they don't really have time to stick together um, in the same way as if the surfaces are not sliding. There's sort of a little bit more time for, they're called van der Waals forces, to, to connect some molecules in the desk to the eraser right now. If the eraser is sliding past, those, don't, those bonds don't have as much time to form, so it's easier to break them. All right, so that's the equation for kinetic friction. It's the coefficient of kinetic friction multiplied by the normal force. It gives you um, the kinetic friction. And that is a really nice equation because this one is just like always the same value. You just have to calculate the normal force, multiply by the coefficient of kinetic friction, and you know the kinetic friction force. The static friction force is trickier. So the equation for static friction looks similar, but it's not the same. It has an inequality in it. So what this means is that the static friction force at its maximum can be the coefficient of static friction times the normal force, but it could also be a lot less than that. So another way to write this is the static friction force max, like at its maximum, is equal to mu s f n, but the static friction force in general could be anywhere from zero up to that point. It could be a lot less. We'll do an example in one second about sort of what that looks like in, in real life. Okay, coefficients mu k and mu s, what are their units? Um, we can actually figure out their units using either one of these equations. Let's use this one, the kinetic uh, friction force equation, because it's the simpler equation. I'm gonna rearrange this for mu k, so I'm gonna divide both sides by fn, and I get mu k is equal to the friction force divided by fn. Now there's a, a, a thing we can do to figure out the units of something we don't know the units of, which is use an equation for variable, which in this case is our equation for mu k, um, and plug in units for all the other things in our equation. So if I know mu k is uh, friction force divided by normal force, I can actually just plug in the units of newtons is the unit of friction force, and newtons are the unit of normal force. What you notice is that they both actually cancel so it turns out that mu k has no units. Same with mu s, so these guys are unitless. It feels really weird, but they're just numbers. Like mu k could be the number 0.52, not 0.52 joules or 0.52 newtons or 0.52 anything. It's just 0.52. It, there's no um, units on mu k or mu s. It's kind of feels a little bit weird at first, but you'll get used to it. Okay, let's look a little closer at that inequality in our um, static friction force equation. We're gonna look at uh, using uh, a scenario with a suitcase. A suitcase won't fit in our video, so I'm going to use an eraser. So in the first situation, there's just the suitcase or eraser. Um, it's just sort of sitting at rest um, on level ground and there's no forces being applied to it. So I drew a picture, a little free body diagram. Here's my suitcase. It would just feel gravity, right? And the normal force. There's not gonna be any applied force. There's not gonna be any friction force. So if I graph that, this would be sort of point, this is one, I'll just graph it as one, is right there. So there's zero applied force, zero friction force. Now what I could do is just apply a small force, this direction, to my suitcase. And if I'm pushing on my suitcase, but it's not going anywhere, there must be a static friction force opposing my pushing on the suitcase, right? That's why it's not moving, even though I am pushing in this direction. Um, so if I drew that picture, Here's my suitcase, it feels a normal force up, it feels gravity down. And in this case, I have a small applied force forwards, Fa, and there's gonna be a static friction force backwards. 
And if for the suitcase to not go anywhere, the static friction force and the applied force have to exactly balance out. So in this case, I'm not calculating static friction using like mu s f n. I'm just figuring it out by saying, well, it's got to exactly balance my applied force in order for the suitcase to remain at rest, for the acceleration to be zero. So maybe I'll put two situation two is right here. So I have a little bit more applied force and then I have exactly the same amount of friction force is balancing that out. We can keep going with this. So if I apply situation three here, a larger force but the suitcase remains at rest, that would look kind of like this. Here's three. Now if I apply enough force so that the suitcase is like just about to start sliding but not quite. So I'm pushing pretty hard but it's not quite sliding yet then this is the point where we're at our maximum static friction force. So right here, uh, we have F, oh, sorry, F S um, is equal to mu S F N, and we're at the maximum. So that is our maximum static friction force right there is situation four. That's this one here. Um, now we'll go to situation five. So now what we're going to do is apply an even bigger force to the suitcase. So now um, I'll just draw that free body diagram at the bottom here. So we've got our normal force, we've got gravity. But in this case I'm going to apply a very big applied force. But the thing is kinetic friction doesn't depend on the applied force at all. It's not trying to sort of balance thing at, things out. Kinetic friction, FFK, is always mu k f n. So it's always going to be the same size. Um, and it's actually going to not, definitely not balance out this applied force. The suitcase is going to start accelerating forwards. This force is going to win. Um, so if I apply a little bit more applied force, so maybe over here. So I was at a pretty big applied force right here at four, right? Um, but at five, I apply even more force. Well, then actually my friction force is going to drop down. And that's because kinetic friction is usually less than the maximum static friction. And that's because mu k coefficient of kinetic friction is smaller, almost always smaller than mu s. So um, we're going to drop down maybe to about this much friction force. And now that's situation five. Situation six, um, if I keep applying more force, um, higher applied force, I'm going to go over here to a really high applied force. The kinetic friction force doesn't change. So it stays exactly the same value. So let's try and sort of connect our dots and make a little bit of a nice graph. So this purple part here, this is static friction. So this is where um, we're using that inequality, that the static friction force is less than or equal to mu s f n. So it can reach this maximum point, but it can be anything lower than that as well. Once we sort of overcome static friction and start sliding, the friction force immediately drops down to a new level and stays constant because this is the kinetic friction region. And that's where Fk is equal to mu k Fn. So there's no inequality here. Um, the kinetic friction force just stays the same no matter what your applied force is. So hope that kind of clears up the inequality. Um, basically, if you're when you're problem solving, if you have kinetic friction, just use this equation right away, mu k f n. If you have static friction, um, don't dive in and use this equation right away. Check if you're at the point of maximum static friction, so just before it slips, then you can use the simplified equation as an equality, this one here. But if if you don't know if you're at like maximum static friction, if the object's not like just about to slip then you're going to have to use this inequality, which basically makes the equation useless. You're going to have to figure out static friction some other way, like we did here, where we said, well, if the object's not moving, it balances out the applied force, so they're equal to each other. Cool. Let's do a few situations. So these two scenarios both involve a box on the same surface, moving at constant speed in both cases. Um, both surfaces are the same uh, material, so they have the same coefficient of friction in both cases. And in both cases, the box is sliding at constant speed. Um, so if it's sliding along, uh, there must be some sort of a kinetic friction, right? So we're dealing with, um, we're gonna be dealing with the equation FFK equals mu KFN. This is the easier of the two friction equations, so that's kind of nice.
Right, we're going to draw our free by diagram with both scenarios and figure out one of these actually needs an applied force in order to move at constant speed. So first looking at scenario A, so here's the box, it feels a normal force, it feels gravity, and let's say it's sliding this way, so its velocity is that way, well, then it must feel a kinetic friction force backwards if it's sliding that way. And if there's a kinetic friction force backwards but it's going at constant speed, that means constant speed means the acceleration is zero, right? That means all the forces balance. And gravity and the normal force balance, I could believe that, but who is balancing this kinetic friction force? There has to be an applied force here, otherwise this would be impossible for this to be true. Right? For this to be at constant speed, the forces in the x direction have to balance out. To make this a good free body diagram, it needs a coordinate system, so I'm going to make y positive up and x positive this way. All right, scenario B is a little more interesting, it's on a slope here. So there's a slant, here's the box, it would feel gravity down, it would feel a normal force out like this, and it'll feel, if it's sliding down the hill, which it probably is, it'll feel a friction force up the hill. So in this case, it would be a good idea to draw my coordinate system so that y is coming out of the hill and x is up the hill. And that means that gravity would need to be split into two components. So an FGY that is coming into the hill like this, and an FGX which is parallel to the hill and down the hill like that. All right, now in this case, we don't actually need an applied force. There might be an applied force, we don't know that. Um, we don't definitely need an applied force in order to go at constant speed. And that's because our normal force will balance out this component of gravity here and the kinetic friction force will be balanced out by this component of gravity. So all the forces could be balanced in this situation without needing to add an applied force. Now let's look at these two free body diagrams and try to figure out which one has the bigger normal force. So in this case, we said the normal force will balance out this component of gravity, right? Because this is not accelerating in the y direction and there's only two y direction forces, normal and fgy, those two forces have to be equal um, in order to cancel each other out and get zero net force. So the net force in Y is zero for both cases, um, so that means that the normal force will balance at this component of gravity. Over here the same is true, the net force in Y is zero, so the normal force will balance out in this case all of gravity. But if these two boxes have the same mass and the gravity force is the same, then this component of gravity, just a little part of gravity, FGY, has to be smaller than all of gravity, right? So gravity is the same in both pictures, but here the normal force is just balancing out part of gravity, whereas here the normal force has to balance out all of the force of gravity. So scenario A here must have a bigger normal force. So scenario A must have a larger normal force. Once we know that, if we want to know which box experiences a larger kinetic friction force, we know our equation for FFK is always equal to mu k Fn, and we said that the surfaces are the same, the materials are the same, so the coefficient of kinetic friction is the same. If the normal force is bigger in scenario A, that means the friction force has to be bigger in scenario A as well. So that will also be scenario A. Let's look a little closer at scenario B, because um, it makes for some interesting problem solving. Um, so this is kind of a fun problem because we're told that the ramp is tilted at 20 degrees and the box slides at constant speed and we can calculate the coefficient of friction with that. It feels like we do not have enough information here. Like we don't know what the mass of the of the box is. Um, we, d we don't know very much about the situation, right? We just literally know one number. Um, so it feels like we don't have enough, but we actually do. This is one of those beautiful situations where we can kind of go forward with a problem that seems really hard to solve um, and we'll actually find that a lot of the things we thought we needed cancel out. So. Always start with your free body diagram, draw my ramp, sorry that was a little steeper than the real ramp, um, sometimes it's hard to get these just right. Okay, there's my angle, it's a 20 degree angle, and here's the box up here. The box would feel a force of gravity, straight down, so FG here. It'll feel a normal force, straight up like this, there's FN. And it's going to be sliding down the ramp, of course, because gravity is pulling it down the ramp. So there'll be a friction force up the ramp, and it's a kinetic friction force because it's sliding. It's a good idea to draw a coordinate system that is parallel to the ramp. So make our x positive up the ramp and y positive out of the ramp, like this. And that forces me to split up gravity into two components. 
was going to be FGY here and FGX. Don't forget your arrows on these guys. They have directions. FGY is into the uh, ramp and FGX is down the ramp. All right, we've done this kind of trigonometry a bajillion times. Maybe not that many times, but a few times. Um, this is a little right angle triangle. Angles in a right angle triangle add up to 180, so 20 plus 90 plus this must be 70. Um, this is also a right angle. 70 plus something must add up to 90. That's got to be the 20 degrees in there. Okay, let's calculate gravity. Oh wait, I have a problem. I don't know the mass. That, that should be fine. I'm just going to write down the equation for what gravity is. It's just m times g, right? Um, I'm not going to put a sign here because this vector is not parallel to x or y. So it doesn't get a sign. When we do fgy and fgx, that's where we're putting our sign in. So we'll do those next. So fgy, that one's going to be negative, and that's because it's clearly into our hill, and y is positive out of the hill. So it's negative. It's going to be negative the hypotenuse, which is mg. And then if you remember our trick, uh, cos is close, fgy is close to the 20 degree angle, so it'll be cos 20 degrees. fgx is going to be also negative because we set up to be up the hill to be positive, and fgx is down the hill. So it'll be negative our hypotenuse, which is mg, times sine of 20 degrees, because it's opposite my angle here. All right, um, I've drawn my free body diagram, I've calculated gravity, sort of, as much as I could. I've split everything into components that is not already parallel to x and y. My next step in any kind of forces problem is just to sum up forces in x and y. So I'm going to start up with y. Doesn't matter which side you pick first, but I'm going to use the, the y direction first and sum up all the forces in the y direction. So in my y direction, I have a few forces. I have a normal force, right, coming out of the page here, and I have this component of gravity down here. So some of the forces in the y direction is Fn plus Fgy. I'm going to plug in what those are. So some of the forces in the y direction is Fn. Fgy is, uh, I just calculated here, mg cos 20, right? So I'll plug that in. mg cos 20. There it is. Now I also know that this box is not accelerating in the y direction, so ay is zero, so therefore the net force in the y direction must be zero. So I can say zero equals fn minus mg cos 20. And I'm going to move the negative mg cos 20 to the other side so it can become positive, so add it to both sides. So it becomes positive mg cos 20 is equal to fn. And then I'm just going to write that forwards because it looks weird. Fn is mg cos 20. It doesn't feel like I've really accomplished anything here. I don't know mass. I don't know the normal force here. So there's not really anything I can solve for at this point. But it turns out it's going to be really helpful to have an equation for the normal force. So I'm going to put a little box around that because we might use that later. So sometimes this happens in a physics problem. You go and you find something, you sum up forces in some direction and you find something and it's not really what you wanted to find, but it might be useful. So just keep it on the side that you can save that for later. Um, what we're trying to find is the coefficient of friction. So um, let's keep going, um, see if we can find a little bit more information. So let's sum up our forces in the y direction or in the x direction, sorry, I just did y, x direction next. So in the x direction, what have I got here? I have a kinetic friction force, so F, F, K, and I have the component of gravity, so F, G, X. I could plug in kind of what those are. So the kinetic friction force, there's an equation for it, right? It's mu K, F, N. Um, by the way, this equation here doesn't tell you the sign of the friction force, so you have to get that from your picture. So I'm using the fact that x is positive up the hill to say that this is a positive mu kfn, but if this friction force had been down the hill, I would have said negative mu kfn, so it's all about my picture to get the sign. The equation just tells me like the size, the magnitude of the kinetic friction force. I need um, my coordinate system here to tell me the sign. So it's positive because it's up the hill. So that friction force will be mu kfn. This guy here, uh, FGX, I actually already calculated him, the negative mg sine 20, so minus mg sine 20. Um, same with the other direction. I know the acceleration in the x direction is zero because this box is sliding at constant speed. 
so therefore the net force in the x direction will also be zero. Um, so I'm running out of space, I'm just going to drop down a little bit here. So I'll have zero is equal to uh, the mu k times fn. I'm putting it in green for a reason here, you may guess why. Minus mg sine 20. So at this point, we're kind of stuck, it feels like. We don't know mass, we don't know normal force, and what we're trying to solve for here is mu k. Fortunately, I have a really nice equation for the normal force, that's why I made this green. The equation for the normal force, I came from summing up things in the y direction. I have this nice equation right here. So I'm going to take this equation for the normal force and just sneak it right in there. Sneak it in here for the normal force. Um, and then we'll have a really lovely equation um, that has at least one fewer variable, so maybe it will it'll all work out. It, it will, I promise. Um, Maybe that's giving away the, the ending here. Spoiler alert. All right, normal force is mg cos 20. That's my equation from down below. And then I'll just write the rest of this minus the mg sine 20. All right, this is looking better. Let's simplify things a little bit just by moving the negative mg sine 20 to the other side. So adding it to this side, it becomes positive. Feels a little better that way. Positive mg sine 20 equals mu k mg cos 20. Oops, I ran a bit room there a little bit there. I'm trying to rearrange for mu k, so what if I divide both sides by mg? That will actually cancel the mass on this side, cancel g on this side. It'll cancel the mass on this side and cancel g on this side, so this is kind of crazy. Turns out that the coefficient of friction here doesn't actually depend on the mass at all. It doesn't even depend on g, so it doesn't depend on what planet you're on. Um, so this whole thing just simplified to sine 20 is equal to mu k times cos 20. There's a cos 20 in there, it's just small. Um, I can just divide both sides by cos 20. And I'm done, I have mu k on its own. I'll just write it forward so it looks nicer. Mu k is sine 20 over cos 20. For those of you who are fans of trig identities, that happens to be tan 20, which are fun, sine over cos. Um, I'll put that into my calculator, so I could do sine 20 divided by cos of 20 uh, gives me 0.36. I have just two sig figs here, so mu k is 0 0.36. And for you trig identity fans, you could have just done tan of 20, and you would have gotten the same answer. Okay, um, that is my coefficient of friction right there. All right, let's do another example. Actually, maybe a slightly easier one. This one's a bit easier because it's not on an angle. I find things can be a bit simpler when they're not on an angle. So here you are pushing on a textbook, uh, trying to hold it against the wall, trying to keep it from slipping down. Um, you apply a force directly into the wall of 60 newtons. The textbook is three kilograms. Also, let's just write down, we have actually, in the last problem I didn't write down our given information because there was just so little of it. Here we actually do know a few things. We know the mass is 3.0 kilograms. Um, and we know the applied force, Fa, is 60.0 newtons. Um, and we don't want the book sliding down. So that means the acceleration in the x direction is zero and the acceleration in the y direction is zero. So nobody's sliding anywhere. Um, and what we're trying to find, so our required, Um, is the minimum coefficient of static friction. So the static friction force that just will keep it from slipping down. All right, let's draw our free body diagram of the book. So here's the book. It would feel a force of gravity straight down, so there's Fg. It'll feel a normal force from the wall, right? There's a wall it's against here. So there'll be a normal force here, keeping it from going through the wall. There's an applied force that you're applying to it. That's Fa. And there must be a static friction force holding it on the wall, so FFS. So we've got a static friction force that's actually pulling up in this situation, keeping it from falling down. Gravity, of course, pulling straight down. Normal force is 90 degrees to the wall, so it pushes just straight out of the wall. And your applied force is into the book and into the wall. It's not a free body diagram without a coordinate system, so I'll make Y positive up and X positive this way. Um, 
Now, if I had any forces that were at an angle, I would at this point split them into their components in X and Y, but I don't. So I can just dive right in and sum up forces in X or sum up forces in Y. You can pick which one you want to do first. Doesn't really matter. So sum up the forces in X first, maybe, this time. I've got a normal force and I have an applied force in the X direction. Um, I happen to know that uh, the acceleration in the X direction is zero. Uh, so that means the sum of my forces in X will also be zero. Uh, so I can calculate um, a little bit more here. Normal force plus the applied force. Um, what I'll get is that the normal force, if I move the applied force to the other side, is just negative of the applied force. So it kind of makes sense. Your applied force is 60 newtons. Your normal force, Fn, must be negative 60 newtons. I can add that to a thing that I've been given now. All right, that's going to be helpful because um, we're going to sum up forces in the y direction now. So in the y direction, I have a static friction force, FFS, and I have gravity. Um, in the y direction, this is not sliding down yet, so the acceleration is zero. So therefore, the sum of my forces in the y direction must also be zero. So I can say zero equals that static friction force plus gravity. Maybe I'll replace these with what they are. So gravity is going to be mg, and it's negative because it's down. So I can put that in. So gravity will be negative mg. And the static friction force, so in general, like the static friction force in general is less than or equal to mu s fn. But at the moment, right before something slips, um, so at the maximum, FFS is equal to mu s fn. So we're actually interested in the coefficient of friction just before the book slips down. Like what's the smallest coefficient we can have before the book starts to slide? Which means we're at the point of maximum static friction, like right before the sliding happens. So that means I actually can replace static friction force here with mu s fn. We just have to be really careful about it because if we're not at the point of almost slipping, then this equation is not generally true. It could be less than that as well. But in this case, we're right at slipping. So I can say static friction is indeed mu s fn, and that is going to be positive. Okay, here's where signs get really tricky. Um, and I'll be a little more particular about this equation. Technically, we always take the absolute value or the positive sign of our normal force when we plug it in here. That's important because the overall sign of our friction force has to come from our picture. And this is one of those situations where the friction force would be positive, but the normal force C is a negative x. So my normal force here, if I plugged it in as just a negative number, would make my friction force negative, and that's not allowed, right? My friction force has to be a positive here. So just watch out for that. Our normal force is negative 60, that's absolutely true, but our friction force, we're gonna have to use the positive value to plug in there. Cool, all right. Um, I'm trying to solve for mu s, and this looks like a really great equation to do that. So I'll move mg to the other side. So I get mg is equal to mu s fn. I just get to divide both sides by fn. And this is the absolute value of Fn, so the positive of Fn. Um, then I can cancel that normal force out, and I get mu s is mg divided by the absolute value of the normal force. Uh, and then I'll just plug in all my numbers. So mu s is going to be the mass, which is 3 kilograms. g is 9.8. The absolute value of the normal force is positive 60 cross all those in, so we have 3 times 9.8 divided by 60, and I get 0.49, and I'm allowed two sig figs here, so that's actually perfect, 0.49, and there's no units on mu s, so I am done right there. So I thought we'd wrap up by just looking at a few interesting coefficients of friction. Um, you don't have to memorize these, I'll always give them in, to you in a problem, but they're just kind of interesting to think about. Um, so most of these are for driving. So your car wheels on dry concrete has a really great coefficient of friction if you're skidding, and an even better one if you're rolling without slipping, which is how you should be driving. Um, one is really high, eight also very high. Like this is not going to, to um, skid very far, so it's great. Um, if it's raining out, um, it gets a bit a bit more dangerous. So um, even if you're rolling normally, 
um, on concrete that is, is wet, um, your coefficient of friction is going to drop down to 0.7. It actually drops all the way down to 0.5, which is pretty uncomfortable um, for, for a road anyway, when you're driving, especially at high speeds, um, in the rain. So if you start a skid um, on a concrete highway, um, that's that's going to be a, a fairly dangerous coefficient of friction. You can skid quite a long ways there, depending on how fast you're initially going. Um, asphalt is, has sort of its interesting properties in that overall it has lower coefficients of friction when it's dry out, so it seems like it would just be generally worse. So 0.75 for skidding, 0.9 um, for uh, for driving normally, but those are both still really good. Um, but what's interesting about asphalt is actually it it's, doesn't get quite as bad when it's rainy, so it doesn't get as slick as concrete, and you may have experienced this when you're driving on concrete, it can get just very slick, it's very smooth. Asphalt has a little bit more texture to it. Um, when it's rainy, um, your coefficient of static friction can drop down to 0.75, your coefficient of kinetic friction only drops down to 0.65, so not nearly so bad as, as wet concrete, right? Wet asphalt is going to be a little bit stickier, um, which is just a lot better for um, for keeping your car on the road and, and not sliding quite so far if you do enter a skid. Alright, the really scary situations are when you're driving on ice, so rubber tire on ice. Um, if you're driving uh, on ice and you enter a skid, your coefficient of friction is actually just 0.15. That's extremely low. You're going to slide for a long time. Um, so if you're taking a corner, your car will have this inertia, right, that it wants to go straight even if you're trying to turn it, and it can just keep going off that road. Um, you can feel like you have basically no control at all, like you're, the friction force is doing nothing for you. That's not true, it's doing something for you, but it's just very small. The friction is really low. Um, even if you aren't skidding, the friction force is still really low. So even if you're driving perfectly, you don't enter a skid, you're really careful, um, you're still going to have an insanely low friction force. Your maximum friction force is just going to be 0.2 times your normal force, which is really small. Um, and you've definitely probably felt that if you've ever driven in freezing rain. Um, it's kind of scary. Don't recommend it. Just stay off the road if it's freezing rain. Uh, a situation where it's fun to have low friction is of course sledding. So say you have a wooden sled on snow, um, the coefficient of kinetic friction is what you really care about because you want to slide down the hill really fast, and it's really low. So the coefficient of friction between wood and snow is only 0.12, which is great for sledding because you'll slide really quickly. It's a tiny bit higher um, for static friction. You may have felt that if you're maybe pulling your little sister on the sled and you stop for a second. When you try and pull to get started again, you have to exert just a little more force to overcome that static friction. Once it gets sliding again, you'll notice the friction force kind of drops down to 0.12. Um, and that's it for friction.